Maria Grace Family. As a one with dairy, as a one with dairy, as a one with dairy, to the spirit we lead. Rather, Sasas, in the shadow, Indeed, Ese Kwan Videri, our great family, you have built nations of men, you make great men of them. I welcome all of you to tonight's webinar series. This is the second in the series, and it promises to be awesome because we have a very, a very knowledgeable Blobi who's going to share uh, very important nuggets for all of us in the digital space. But before we go on, uh, as you are welcomed by the school anthem, it's important for an AOBA executive member to do the official welcome. And so at this point, I want to hand over to um, Albert, Albert Corte, if uh, he's here. And he, together with uh, the secretary for AOBA, will do the official welcome and a, a little AOBA business before we delve into the presentation. Over to you, Albert. Albert, you may need to un unmute your mic. I think you are still on mute, so you may need to unmute your mic, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Good evening, fellow Blobby. Uh, senior, senior Secretary, please, are you around? Yes, I am. Um, I am. Oh, okay. So, Hello. Senior, let me give the floor to you. Albert, I, 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 I am around. Yes, yeah, Senior. Yes. Okay, so, Senior, I, let me give you the floor to you. Yeah, when you okay, Albert. So, the flight is on your Senior. Thanks. Thanks, Albert. And uh, thanks, Kuonu. Yeah, it's a long time I met you. It's been a while. Yes, absolutely. It's so, been a while. Uh, yes. So, on behalf of our executive committee, the executive council, and indeed all our will be present, I wish to welcome you to the second series of our webinar. Um, I think. It is very important we avail ourselves of this logical age instruments, one of which is, has become indispensable, and that is the IT. The IT, as we know now, has taken over everything in view of the the pandemic. So with the restrictions in place, the best we can do is to have these conferences online and to upgrade our knowledge using Aoba products who are experts and of course globally accepted experts, not just locally accepted experts, but globally accepted experts. I also want to, on behalf of Blaubi, 
apologize for the late start of this webinar. Um, I have just been informed that uh, Blaubi Eric S.C. Aquine will be in another meeting, but he will join us in a jiffy, maybe in a couple of minutes. But permit me to give you a brief profile of Eric. Eric undoubtedly is a blobby because we can use any other facilitator apart from the products of our school. He was the first head boy of the current crop of products of our of, of uh, Accra Academy, that is the SSS, SHS. You know, we are of the old <laughs> system, but in this in, in, in his period, when he was a student of the school, we had two groups of <coughs> students. The old system, that was when the old system was facing out, and therefore, we had a head boy who was a sixth former, and since the presence of SHS or that time, SSS, <coughs> was also in session, it was deemed fit to also leadership the new group of students. So Eric was the first head boy of the current school system. He is also a fellow of very renowned institutions, institutions is a fellow of Stanford, Mitt, uh, Ted, and Harvard, very renowned institutions in the world. Currently, he is the managing partner of Shanzo Capital, an entrepreneur and investor with 15 years of ICT industry leadership globally. He has worked in the two countries, setting up ISPC. S, sorry, ISPS, ISPAS, IXPS, and high tech setups. He co founded Angel Africa, Angel Fair Africa, and currently serves on the board of Pharma Line, Hoptel, uh, Forhe, Teriga. Solutions, Hotel Online, Walla Amp, IT, Same Logic, Wanjo Foods, Airstop, Rapid Exercise, Nesquay, Data Integrated, Ghana Cyber City, Wapco, and some of which are his investment. He was part of the team that built the team submarine cable in East Africa, and an ICT consultant for the World Bank, Soros Foundation, um, as well as African governments and private firms. He authored the Kings of Africa's Digital Economy and co authored the Open Access mon uh, Model adopted by telecommunications industry, negotiating the net, the politics of internet diffusion in Africa and the internet on Ghana with Mosaic Group. He was invited to contribute ideas to Prime Minister Tony Blair of Great Britain, which commissioned <coughs> for Africa. Eric Sherquine undoubtedly is, stands tall in the ICT world, and we should be privileged to have him to take us through what it takes to be knowledgeable in the IT world 
which now rules the whole um, world. Um, at this juncture, I want to pause so that before he joins us uh, about a couple of minutes, maybe about eight minutes time, we can discuss issues which border on Accra Academy Old Boys Association uh, with my able deputy, uh, Albert Kwati. So, um, yeah. Uh, yes. And, uh, Albert, yes. Yes, it is. You can take Yes. Yes, I'm listening, Albert. Yeah, we've been informed that uh, the guest speaker. Yeah, hello. Uh, can you please hear me? We are just yes, been informed hear, that the, uh, we are we have just been informed that a guest speaker is is joined us. So I would like you to he welcome him us. to. Oh, okay, that's yeah, great. He's already up. Oh, prepared. okay. Okay, so Eric, can I see you on the screen? It's been a while. Can I see Eric on the screen? That's correct. It's been, it's been a long while. Uh, Eric, Eric, uh -huh. you have changed. If I meet you uh, on the streets, I will not be able to recognize you. Though I know you very well during your student days at the Crack Academy, I know you are also related to our yeah. revered coach, Coach Tapon. Yes, Coach Tapon is my uncle. Yes, I am very well. And Coach Tapon, uh, maybe you can wish him a belated birthday. He yeah. celebrated his 70th birthday yesterday. We yeah, are wow. another platform where we have the sports legends and we share a lot of things there. Right. So, Eric, welcome. And we are all here to, to take us through the, 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 the power of the world now. It is not a gun, it is nothing but ICT. And I'm happy <laughs> to know that you have uh, an icon in that industry. So Eric, you are welcome. Thank you. Thank Once you. a prefect, always a prefect. So <laughs> now you are the head of the meeting that we're going to hold today. So you are welcome, Eric. All right, thank and, you. And make time and visit me. I still go to the school. Yeah. So make time and come to the school and share your experience with the current kids. Absolutely. Absolutely, I'll do that. So I hand over the microphone to you. I'll mute mine. I'll mute my dad. All right. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to be uh, among Blur B. Um, and uh, thanks a lot to Yao for reaching out and uh, ensuring that I could uh, join today. And uh, my apologies for joining a little late. I had some other engagement that um, I, I, I lost sight of. I wasn't taking, uh, paying attention to my schedule. So I only realized today that the schedule will run over a little bit. So my apologies for that. Um, so um, all protocols observed. Uh, uh, I'm so excited that I could share a little bit of my, uh, my life experience. And as uh, you said, Yesterday was my uh, dear uncle, Coach Sapon's uh, birthday, and uh, we talked quite a bit and spent some time together. And as a matter of fact, if it wasn't him, I wouldn't have been in Accra Academy. So I actually got admission to Presec. And then when he heard about it, he was like, what, what kind of school are you going to? No, you got to come here. <clears throat> and I remember he, he took me to Freeman and, and said that, you know, he needs to be in this school, not in the other school. Um, and so I owe a lot of my gratitude for, uh, being able to get, uh, my secondary education at Accra Academy to, uh, my uncle could sap on. Um, so what I 
try to do tonight is to um, probably share my life experience. Um, I, you know, y'all said that I should try and make it informal and interactive. So what I'm going to do is that we have now uh, about 30 minutes. Uh, so I, I will, um, well, it's uh, 32 minutes. So I'm going to probably do two more minutes of introduction. And then I'm going to talk about my life in three phases. So I've kind of probably had um, three evolutions uh, since uh, I left Accra Academy. So I will share those. And then within that process, I will try and emphasize the theme of digital innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, which is pretty much, uh, you will see that it's the hallmark of my life. Uh, and uh, I think my life has got a long way to go, um, but uh, I will tell you where I am so far. Um, so as I indicated, you know, I came to Accra Academy um, by way of my uncle, Kut Sapon. Um, and uh, immediately, the first time I stepped foot on the campus, I knew that it was a place to be. Um, it's a place that felt at home. Um, and um, at that time, me and I lived with my dad. We lived in Odoko. So it was uh, a one car ride to get to school. And then I eventually came to the boarding house uh, in my second year. Um, so those were pretty amazing experiences for me um, growing up. Um, the things that Accra Academy taught me shaped my view of the world. And, and it all started also in Accra Academy, uh, where I became a member of the computer club. And that was the first time I encountered a computer. And immediately I turned the computer in the computer lab. I knew that this was going to be my craft for the rest of my life. Um, so my colleagues will tell you that um, when we were in school, uh, whenever I had a spare time, I was in the computer lab. Um, some others were doing cadets and uh, some played soccer. Um, I was very good at soccer, but you know, I wasn't really into it. Um, but the computer really grabbed my attention and that became um, my focus. Um, so my first iteration was really that um, I got into uh, building ISPs. I started a consulting company called Internet Research. Prior to that, I was consulting in my own name. And prior to that, I had helped start a, start a company called Africa Express. Um, and prior to that, I had worked at a company called Ghana Classifiers, which was one of the first um, um, online content providers. Uh, and prior to that, I was doing some stints at MCS and Africa Online. So sort of that um, uh, state of my life really uh, was my orientation, how I got into the internet industry. And so I quickly um, learned the trade of how to build computer networks. And essentially, um, once something really sparked uh, my conviction at that time, a lot of people didn't know about the internet. And so when you talked about the internet, people thought it was email. And so I decided to start educating people. So I started writing the daily graphic. I had a column there. And then I also started the first ICT program called ICT World and Choice of Her. Um, those uh, efforts uh, helped me to influence and shape Ghana's first ICT policy, which was a policy framework that we created and uh, our former president, uh, Kufu, when he, he, his first time in office, um, at that time, some of my colleagues and I, we were part of the Ghana Institute on, of Information Technology, GIIT. And so we helped craft the policy, the policy framework for IT. Uh, post that, um, I started the Ghana ISP Association, which was an association of ISPs um, across the country. As I indicated, I was also involved in setting up some of the ISPs, including the most famous being Busy Internet. Um, so when we set up Busy Internet, it wasn't just an ISP, it was sort of a, a technology um, um, innovation space. And, and the reason was that we didn't just want to create a space for um, connectivity. We wanted to create a space for innovation, for entrepreneurship. And so um, we had 
you know, a conference space. We had meeting rooms. We had space for startups. Um, and, and we also had our famous uh, um, liquid bar and restaurant, which was a place uh, that people hang out. Um, so Busy Internet was a very uh, formative part of um, one of the most successful ventures that I helped set up. Um, whilst we're doing Busy Internet, I also got into um, consulting and helping build a few other ISPs across Africa, um, i.e. Um, ISP Kenya in Kenya, um, Malawi Net in Malawi. We did uh, one to net in Uganda. Um, I was involved um, also in um, ISPs in South Africa, um, ISPs in Botswana, in Namibia, um, uh, and a few other countries. And so um, all of this was really um, part of my African journey, you know, traveling the continent and helping connect these countries to the internet. And I work with a very uh, amazing team of different people uh, in different countries um, at different stages. And for me, it showed me that Africa was really uh, one big united family because I got to not only go and build technology, but I got to experience the cultures of these countries. And I got to interact with people. And increasingly, as I interacted and I engaged, it was very clear to me that there was a lot of commonality in the cultures, in the mannerisms, in the way people lived and where people do things. And so increasingly, I was convinced that Africa was a very one big family before um, the colonial masters came. And so building ISPs was a very, very uh, pivotal moment in my career. Um, in addition to setting up the Ghana ISP Association, together with a few other of my colleagues, we started also the African ISP Association. And the reason we started the African ISP Association was that we wanted to create a continental trade front for the ISPs. Because we realized that, you know, increasingly the ISPs were um, a marginalized uh, group of uh, businesses who were mostly SMEs. So if you look at most uh, countries, the ISPs were really the kind of the, what you call SMEs. They were businesses that were, you know, employing uh, in most cases more, less than 100 people, um, but also that they were businesses that enabled other businesses. In other words, they connect other businesses to the internet. And so they were really enabling a lot of other businesses, even though they were small businesses. And they were really the... Uh, the, the means by which a lot of people got to experience the internet. And so we felt that it was important for us um, to come together and have a very common front. And the reason we, the second reason we had to do that was because we were seen as the underdogs. You know, back then, the incumbent uh, telecom operators, i.e. the Ghana telecom type of guys, were the, were the Goliaths. And uh, we, the small ISPs, were the Davids. So uh, we decided to set up this trade association because we thought it would be a very um, good way for us to bring our experiences together, um, create a common front, and uh, be able to you know, confront the Goliath uh, when it was necessary. So setting up uh, AFRISPR, um, the African ISP Association, was another pivotal moment in, in my um, years of building ISPs. And when we set up the African ISP Association, we had three key objectives. The first was obviously to be a front, a trade front for the ISPs to negotiate. But the second was that we wanted to really um, build the infrastructure of the internet on the continent. The third was that we wanted to be a very, very strong lobbying body um, to basically permeate and push the internet into other, other spheres of African life. And uh, we were able to achieve these three objectives in the two terms that I served um, as uh, the founder and also elected as executive secretary. Um, at that time also, I was still the executive secretary of the Ghana ISP Association. So 
I literally had three jobs. I was running my own consulting business, internet reset, I was building ISPs. And then I was running the Ghana ISP Association and then the African ISP Association. So it was a very, very a busy time in my life. And I remember that in those times, I didn't believe in sleep. I used to sleep two, three hours uh, maximum a day. And I think I did that for probably 10 years. And it was a lot of traveling and a lot of work. Um, and it was very fulfilling as well. Um, it was very fulfilling because not only was I building a very important career for myself, but I was also making a lot of impact. And I was having a lot of um, experiences in the process. And so the three things that the Ghana ISP Association achieved was we set up the Ghana Internet uh, Exchange, which was a local network to connect all the ISPs so that if you are an ISP A and you send an email to another ISP, it stays within Ghana. Um, we also led a process to reduce the cost of connectivity on the, at that time, the only submarine cable connecting Africa to the rest of the world, SAT-3. Um, um, the third thing that we did was that we managed to get internet to become very, very pervasive um, across financial services, across education, across health, across, across agriculture. So that was on the ISP side. On the AFISPA side, we also achieved some of those things. Um, the first was that we helped create more ISPs across the continent. We also helped create more ISP associations. And then the third thing was that we helped create, we also helped create a lot of internet action points. And then in some cases, we helped create uh, internet, um, 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 internet hubs. Um, in certain cases, which were rich sub-regional uh, connectivities. Um, through that process, we also um, were a very lobby, strong lobby group, and we managed to lobby the African Union. Uh, I remember in 2007, we went, 2006, I beg your pardon, we went to one of the African Union summit and lobbied the African Union. Actually, that was 2005. Um, forgive me, but I'm still trying to, Play this out of my memory. We, we managed to lobby the African, IS, uh, African Union to actually make uh, creating internet exchange points a part of their charter. And so the project that we, we launched and we got them to adopt was called the Africa Internet Exchange System, which was a way to make sure that um, there was a local internet fabric on the continent. And so to today, if you go to the African Union website, there's a project called the Africa Internet Exchange System Access, which was a project that we launched and we got the African Union to, to adopt. So that was sort of my first, uh, you know, first part of my career. And I'm going to kind of shift to the second part of my career, which is sort of a logical uh, follow up to my first, the first part of my career. So after we did all of this, one of the things that became very clear to me was that Africa didn't have um, a, enough submarine cables to connect to the global internet. Don't forget that whilst we were building these ISPs, it was also the same time that, um, you know, mobile became a part of African life. There was a huge mobile explosion that happened. I wasn't involved in any of the mobile businesses. I didn't set up any mobile business, but I was involved in setting up the ISPs and so, one of the things that became quite clear to me was that these mobile uh, networks are going to be really connecting um, the, everyone to the internet. But guess what? The whole of Africa at that time, and now I'm talking about 2005, 2006, the whole of Africa had one submarine cable. And basically a submarine cable is a high speed connectivity um, that connects um, the whole world. This is how the internet works. We are connected by big submarine cables that run uh, across the oceans. So there's what we call the, the transatlantic cables, uh, the Indian Ocean cables, um, and then the cables around various continents. But Africa at that time had only one. And as I said, we had actually managed to negotiate down the price on that cable in Ghana and also in other countries. 
But it became very clear to us that Africa needed more submarine cables. And so luckily for me, around that time, there was a very uh, 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 a huge program at uh, Stanford University called the Digital Visionary Program, which was funded by the Routers Foundation. And basically that program admits uh, digital visionaries um, to, to Silicon Valley. And, and when you go there, you do three things. Obviously, you, you take classes. Um, but the third is you do research um, on a very major uh, problem that you want to solve. And then um, the third thing is that you create the minimum viable product, which is sort of the nucleus of that pro problem you're trying to solve or the solution. And then when the program ends, you go back to the country that you came from to implement what uh, you have uh, created. So I basically applied and, uh, uh, and, and basically um, my thesis was that I wanted to um, come back and build submarine cables around Africa. Um, I remember when I first told the, uh, the, the, the director of the center, he couldn't believe, he said, how are you gonna build submarine cables around Africa? Africa is so huge. And, um, and as we talk, um, uh, Stuart realized that I had a very big vision. And that's exactly the kind of visionaries that this program uh, wanted to bring to Silicon Valley. So that's how I, I went to Stanford. Uh, but prior to that, one of the details I left out of when I was building ISPs, I also had a fellowship at, uh, at Harvard. And so my colleagues at Harvard actually wrote a recommendation for me. And that's how I got accepted into the fellowship program at Stanford. And so I went on the Stanford campus, uh, I stayed there for a year. And I wrote a groundbreaking paper on open access models, which was a different way of building submarine cables, um, which was uh, contra contrary to the old model, which is the closed, closed club consortium. So that um, work really got a lot of notoriety. And I also got invited by the World Bank to be part of a consulting team made up of uh, a gentleman called Russell Southwood out of London and Anders Kumstead from Stockholm. And we wrote the open access models for backbone connectivity in Africa. And through that project, the World Bank um, decided to fund a submarine cable in Africa called EASY. But immediately I came back uh, from this, uh, the study, um, I was invited by the Kenyan government to be part of a team to build the first submarine cable in East Africa called the East African Marine System Teams. And so that cable was uh, sort of the uh, manifestation or the practicality of the theory or what I had gone to study. And so it was a very fulfilling exercise. I lived in Kenya for almost six months where we planned um, execute and executed the submarine cable. Um, and this was in 2007, 2008. And if all of, if any of you will recall, it was during that time that Kenya had election violence. So when Kenya was really bending down, we were busy connecting it to the rest of the world. Um, um, so my company, you know, in Kenya, we, we ended up becoming, becoming shareholders in the Teams Cable. Uh, we finally sold those shares to another um, a company we were bought over. But that was the first uh, practical experience of building a submarine cable. So we built a Teams cable that connected Mombasa, which is sort of the coastal town, one of the coastal towns in Kenya, to Fujaira in the Middle East. And um, our counterpart on the cable was Etisalat uh, in the Middle East. And uh, there were probably about 15 of us that really worked on this project over a six to nine month period. Um, so when we finished that, um, obviously that connected East Africa. The cable came live in 2009, um, after which I returned to West Africa. When I returned, I was involved in also building another cable called Main One. In the case of Main One, I was just a consultant. Um, it was founded by a lady called Fanke Opeke from Nigeria, and she uh, enlisted my expertise as somebody who's done it before as a consultant. Um, after doing main one, I decided to sort of concentrate on uh, back in Ghana. And so at that time, um, you know, it was sort of the last two years of President Kufour's uh, government. 
and uh, we, we convinced uh, the government to set up what we call the National Communication Backbone Company, NCBC, which was basically an open access model uh, of a career's career. This time it was a, ter a terrestrial fiber network, not a submarine cable. And, and the difference is that the submarine cables connect the continents, but terrestrial fiber networks is what brings the connectivity inland. And the reason I switched to doing that was that I realized that there were more and more submarine cables on the, on the coast of Africa, but we needed to drive that capacity inland. And so it was time to take the concept of open access models into terrestrial fiber networks. And that's how we first did the uh, National Communication Backbone Company. Um, um, and that company was sold as part of uh, the Ghana Telecom Assets to, to Vodafone. And so those submarine cables and those terrestrial fiber networks really drove the capacity that connected to the mobile networks um, to create uh, what you know, I call uh, a mobile broadband. And so Africa was not only a mobile first continent, but it ended up becoming a mobile only continent. In other words, in Africa, the mobile phone is the computer. Until recently, and even till now, even now, most people see the internet through their phone. I'm pretty sure that a lot of you on this, uh, on, on our chat right now are connecting through your phones. So the phone is really the computer in Africa. And so the third uh, caption is that Africa became a mobile web continent. In other words, most people see the web through their phones. Um, and, uh, and very few people see the web through um, computers, as is the case in the West and also through cable uh, infrastructure. So essentially, Africa became a very different phenomenon from the rest of the world. In a sense that the way we interact with the internet was through mobile devices, which was very, very different from how the West interact um, with um, um, the internet. And so that created a totally new phenomenon um, where Africa started leading how mobile and mobile web is developed. And so I started seeing innovations um, that were very contrarian to what I've seen in Silicon Valley in other places. And so I started researching and I started realizing that that innovative spirit that I had seen in Silicon Valley and that innovative spirit that I had read about in Asia um, and also in Europe had started coming to Africa. In other words, the next generation of entrepreneurs has started taking this mobile you know, broadband and started using it to solve problems and creating solutions to local problems in Africa. So that leads me to my third you know, um, uh, iteration, um, which is what I do now, um, which is that I started mentoring some of these startups and then started investing in some of these companies. And the way I was doing this was some of the companies I built before, I started exiting some of those companies. And so started taking some of those, um, that money and started investing and started mentoring. And so um, this was uh, 2012. And so in 20, uh, one of the companies that I was involved in was a company called, used to be called SMSGH and I call Haptel. And, and that company in 2013 wanted to also expand into Africa. So um, I led the expansion of SMSGH. And around that time was when I decided to become a, a full-time investor and started investing across Africa. And with that, I started also uh, an African organization as is, is my norm. I started the Africa Angel List, which was a network of angel investors across Africa. And then we started an event called Angel Fair Africa, which was an annual event that essentially brings entrepreneurs and investors together. And so through that event, every year we select between 10 to 20 entrepreneurs, we invite about 40 to 50 investors, who are a lot of them are my friends and some of them are through my friends network. And then we go to an African city, uh, essentially the entrepreneur speech and we the investors, you know, select which ones we want to invest in, either directly or through syndicates. So in 2013, we did a first event in South Africa. Um, three deals came out of that. Um, 
And, and for me, that was a very defining moment because for our first event to yield three deals, um, um, I, I, I was very clear in my mind that it was uh, a stroke of genius and, and it was going to be a critical part of what I was going to do going forward. So um, Angel Fair has become part of um, what I, I did subsequently. That same year, 2013, I decided to set up um, a fund structure in Mauritius. And so in 2014, um, I set up uh, Chanzo Capital. And Chanzo is a Swahili word, and Swahili is uh, the biggest language derivative of the Bantus. And that's why I went with that word. And, uh, and Chanzo means early stage. Because I wanted to do early stage investing, and I wanted an African word. And, and as uh, some of you may know, I've always had an African identity. I'm very proud of my African identity. Um, today, I'm wearing um, um, the flag of the United States because I sympathize with what's happening in the U.S. And in, the, in my last remarks, I will say something about that. But the, the, the 2013 was 2014. We set up, I set up Tanzo Capital, and I hired a team, and then we started investing. And basically, our model was to back entrepreneurs who were creating solutions to African problems across Africa. Um, so every year, through the Angel Fair event, we went, 2013, we were in South Africa. 2014, we went to Nigeria. 2015, we brought the event to Ghana. Um, 2016, we took it to um, Nairobi, uh, Kenya. Uh, 2017, we took it to Ivory Coast. And, and those were the five kings countries, which is sort of um, the concept that I developed around my investing experience, which is the countries that I really believed were leading um, the digital economy in Africa. And today, you know, the vetted is out and those countries are really the countries that are leading the digital economy. But I postulated these countries in 2013 when I started my angel investing activity that these were the countries that were going to be leading the digital economy across Africa. Um, and I wrote about it. I actually uh, did videos about it. I wrote about it. And, and I've invested in all these countries plus more. Um, 2018, 2017, when we did Ivory Coast, you know, I was tempted to keep the event within the King's countries. But I decided that, well, the King's countries was really a concept to, put, to push digital innovation. And so um, it was important to go to other countries. So we started going outside of the King's. So 2018, we went to uh, Mozambique. We went back to Southern Africa, so we did Mozambique. Um, last year, 2019, we did it in Tanzania. And this year, our plan is to go to Senegal. Um, but uh, hopefully, when things, if things get back to normal, well, when things get back to some form of normal, it will be a new normal, hopefully we'll do it. But most likely, we'll push it to next year. Through this event, we have been able to enable about $23 million worth of investment across mostly tech investments. Um, one of our cohorts from 2016 has exited. Um, we as a fund ourselves, as Chanzo Capital, I mean the 23 million is not all our investment. We've just made us some of those investments. These are investments that are made by different people through the event. Um, but at Chanzo Capital ourselves, we invested in a total of 16 companies so far. Um, and out of those 16, four of them have failed, four of them are profitable, four of them are break even, and four of them are early revenue. So we have a four by four track record um, on our fund. So if you go to our website, uh, I will type in our website for you guys. Our website is Chanzo Capital. Um, and it's basically, um, you will see most of the companies that we've uh, invested in there. And then our event website is uh, Angel, um, Angel Fair Africa. Um, so, uh, you know, so, so basically what I do now is, uh, um, I have three, two other partners in the fund. Um, two of my friends that I've known for many years and we build companies together have, have joined the fund full time. Um, so Ian Zira, who is also Ghanaian. Um, so Ian and I, Ian is operating partner. 
Um, my other partner is um, Tiniko, who's based in South Africa. Um, Tiniko and I have also known each other for more than 15 years. Ian, we've known each other for 18 years. Um, and so we have an office here in Accra, we have an office in Nairobi, and then we have an office in Johannesburg, um, covering Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I spend quite a bit of time traveling this, these countries and um, basically coordinating the team. Um, so uh, I have two more minutes to conclude to eight o'clock and, and, and I'd like to conclude my conversation by saying that um, an integral part of my life was in my formative stages. I spent quite a lot of time in the US in these Ivy League institutions. So, um, and I have a huge network in the US. I did some investments there. Um, and so what is happening in America today, it's really of concern to me. And, and uh, luckily for me in my entire life that I've been um, going to the US and lived there, unfortunately, I've never had any racial issues. So I'm probably an exception to the rule. Um, but racial injustice is very real in the US. And, and it's unfortunate that George Floyd um, died in the way he died. And a lot of people have died uh, in, in the hands of um, cops in the US in a very, very, in very, very bizarre situations. And so um, I sympathize with my fellow um, Africans um, who are also Americans. Um, and I'm really, really hopeful that this is the turning point in America, that racial injustice will be overcome. And America will have equalization and, 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 and African Americans will, will, will have the same level of treatment as every other American, um, no matter the color of their skin. Um, but I also think that what is happening in America connects back to Africa in a lot of ways. Because most African Americans are of, um, are of African descent. And so one of my theorems is that this is also the time for them to think about coming back to the mother continent. Because I strongly believe that Africa is going to be the, the hub of innovation and technology and growth in the 21st century. And in one of my recent uh, posts that I did on my Harvard blog, I talk about the four um, trends that I believe will help Africa overcome COVID-19. Obviously, one of which is digitization and entrepreneurship, which is sort of the bane of my life and I've talked to you about. The second I talk about is the common market in Africa. The fact that Africa has created the common market and that common market is currently estimated at $3 trillion. Now, if you take it that Africa's population is going to basically quadruple over the next two decades, it means that a common market in Africa is probably going to hit $10 trillion, if not more. And so that's a very huge market. And so if you are looking to build a business, Africa is the market to target because it's a very huge market. The third you know, um, phenomenon is the entrepreneurial youth. The fact that most people are taking to entrepreneurship and using digital as a platform, it's a very, very, very powerful phenomenon. And for those of you on this call, um, if you have that entrepreneurial instinct, I would say you should take the leap of faith and follow your heart and do it. It's not gonna be easy because if it was easy, it would have been done already. And then the last of those trends is what I call the returning diaspora. And I really, really believe that we're gonna have a huge um, diaspora returning. I mean, we all saw this, the huge success of the year of return. I, I at least know five people who came back for the year of return and didn't go back to the US. And they've all started businesses here. Um, and I mentioned them in my article. And so um, I believe that entrepreneurship and digital innovation is gonna be what will change Africa. And so I encourage you all if you're looking to, to, do, um, to go into that, by all means, uh, feel free to reach out to me. And if there are ways I can help, I would love to help as a fellow Blobby. So I'll bring my uh, 30 minutes, uh, I'm a bit two minutes uh, over my time, but uh, I will now probably hand it back to the uh, moderator and probably take some questions.
Okay. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, you sound like a, a very accomplished man um, and young and young for that matter. We are proud of you as a Blaubi um, for all the things that you have achieved for yourself and for all the things that you have achieved for Mother Ghana as well. I think that through your presentation, it's clear that you have not only put yourself up on the global map, but also put the country up. And as a subgroup of the country, we Blow Bees are proud of your achievements. So we associate with you very proudly. Um, Thank you. We will be taking questions. We will be taking questions. Uh, and, and fellow Blow Bees, like we did before, uh, this is going to be in a very organized manner. I will, I will be looking out for all of you who are raising your hands and I'll be calling you out so that you can ask your questions. Uh, let's observe some three very simple rules. Make your question straight to the point, so very short and precise. And then two, please mute your mic when you're not speaking. Um, and as much as possible, well, the bandwidth is yours. You can show your video, but it's a bit distracting. So we recommend that you turn off your video as well. Uh, the third one is let's stay uh, uh, in focus in terms of discussion so that we make the best of the time that we have. So I will set the ball rolling by asking uh, a question. Uh, Eric, so all that you have outlined shows that you have indeed uh, built your niche in the digital space and you, you, you have in-depth understanding of the digital landscape and also entrepreneurship. Now, COVID-19 has you know, ha has disrupted our lives and rendered everybody either working from home or, or uh, fixed in a way. A lot of Blobies have fantastic ideas. My question to you is how do they start and how can they leverage digital, you know, to start the business, given that we are not in normal times? So I'll allow you to take that first, and then I'll call three people, take three questions in batches so that you can address them as we go on. All right, thank you. Um, so so uh, this is a very good question, uh, very good preamble. The, the, the best way to start a business is always to solve a problem. If you look at the greatest companies in the world, they've all uh, started by somebody seeing a problem and then asking themselves, can I help solve this problem? And essentially, um, then, you know, building on that ethos to find a way to solve that problem. And, and, and by solving that problem, people get gravitated to that solution and people pay for that solution and they become customers and these companies become big. And so the first step in starting a business is always to find a problem. And the best problems you can solve are always experiences that you've had. And so if you are having some, some challenge, ask yourself, is it a challenge that I can solve? Probably that is where the business starts from. Okay, As thank I you said, very much. Throughout my life, it's been the same thing. I've always solved problems and it's led me to where I am. So look awesome. for a problem and, and if technology can help you solve it, then that's your solution. Not all problems will be solved with technology. There may be others that may not be solved with technology, but and not everyone will be a technology entrepreneur. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Eric. So let me start with Abe Ashon. Um, I see your hand up, and then I'll come to Razak Abubakar, and then I'll go to Nene Ahuma. Let's take these three questions, and then you can uh, answer them. So, Abe Ashon, please, your turn. You need to uh, yeah. unmute your mic. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, thank you very much for putting me in online. Yes, sir. Actually, my hand is not up. I'm not oh, okay. very... Yes, but I have enjoyed the 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 the, the uh, what do you call it the, the presentation the um, 
the presentation by Eric, and I'm yes. so enthused, and and I'm also proud to be associated with Eric. Um, nice one. I may want to ask questions, but I want to do them offline. So if okay. Eric can leave me in contact, then I will do that uh, with him personally. I don't okay. want to share with other people. Yes. <laughs> uh, All right, no person. problem, I'll be sure. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You very I will much. connect you. Yeah. I will connect you, no worries. All right, Mr. Shaw. Okay, uh, let's go to Razak Abubakar, please. Please unmute your mic, Razak. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear okay. you now, sir. Okay, so great. I mean, the truth is that this is the first time I'm using this app. <laughs> and so I don't know how I what I did, but I see you, had, that, you ended up raising your yeah, hand. But, but, okay, but never mind, fine. never mind. I, I still want to go ahead and ask a question. Um, you okay. know, I originally am a journalist, but uh, lately I I happen to work with a, a real estate company, and uh, with the little experience I got it over there, I am starting mine now. I want to find out, and you know, with, with the real estate sector. Quite a lot of the clients usually come from the ones that are likely to pay for properties are the ones that are based abroad. So I'm thinking, uh, what what would Eric advise me to do if I'm looking at reaching out to quite a lot of them out there? Because I've been trying my social media platforms, like for example Facebook, but it looks like it's not enough. What else do I need to do if I want to reach out to quite a lot of people out there? Okay. All right. Uh, thanks. Let's take one more. Uh, so, Nene Ahuma, if you're here. Yeah, I'm here. Um, yes, thank you very much. You. Um, yeah. Okay, so I have three questions. Um, the first one has to do with, I want to find out from him, uh, what what his take on the current uh, issue with the uh, NCA trying to cut down the growth of um, MTN? The second one has to do, he talked about a certain gateway to cut down cost. I want to find out from him, what can we do as a nation to cut down the cost of um, data, the internet data that we use here? Uh, the third one is, um, how easy is it to build an internet service provider for, uh, say, a community or a, a district? Okay, thank That's you. So. Oh, thank you, Nane. So, Eric, we have four questions in total. Um, Razak wants to know uh, how how else he can go about his real estate business. Uh, and then Nene just asked three other questions, which I'm sure you have taken note of. So over to you. Right. Um, so, so, Razak, the, <clears throat> I mean, it, it, the internet has, it, it's almost like you got to see it as, you know, regular, uh, you know, advertising right so you have to do targeted advertising the fact that you post on facebook doesn't mean that the real estate people or customer that you're looking for will see it, right so one of the things you have to do is if you're posting online you have to start targeting your posting you have to start looking for the demographics the kinds of people that you want to sell your houses or your your developments to you have to find a way of reaching them. Uh, for example, uh, now it's known that Facebook is becoming more for you know, older people, right? And uh, younger people are now on, the new thing is TikTok, right? Now, a lot of young people cannot afford houses. So if you go posting your stuff on TikTok, for example, you may not be target, you, know, you may not be getting the right demographics to reach, right? So, um, and it's the same with probably Instagram. I'm just using these uh, just rough examples. But, but I hope you get a concept. So, so you got to figure out a little bit more of detail in terms of the kind of audience you want to reach and, and where on the internet are they, right? And then you start advertising in those mediums. And then you see that you start reaching those people. For example, there are people who uh, will not do Zoom. They only do email, right? So maybe you need to reach those people by sending an email to them. How do you find their email address? Maybe through their business club or through their colleagues, right? 
So what I'm trying to say is that you have to be a bit more targeted in how you reach people. Otherwise, just advertising or posting doesn't reach everyone. Now, let me go to the, the question from, um, sorry, I'm trying to remember the name of the second uh, question here. The so that was Nene. And he Nene. talked about the NCA and... The NCA issue with MTN. Mm -hmm. um, um, Nene, it's a, it's a very uh, tricky issue, huh? Um, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, I first have to start by sort of making, uh, you know, some disclosure. I'm a, I'm a shareholder in MTN, so I'm kind of conflicted. And so my, my views okay. may be a bit biased. Um, but uh -huh. the... The thing is that the, the government basically said um, MTN has become what you call an S&P, so you can market clear. And there's some regulation that was set up. I knew about that. I was actually involved in promulgating that regulation many years ago and with the government is enforcing. Um, but I think that one of the things that is very important in this time and, and context is very important is that we, we're living in a very unusual times, right? And so um, it edges for caution, um, partly also because, um, because of COVID-19, you know, first of all, liquidity has become a problem everywhere. And, and, and so you, you don't want to exacerbate that. And two, there's already enough uncertainty in the market and I'm putting on my sort of investment hard, right? And the uncertainty, when there's uncertainty, people don't invest, people hold back, right? And so the most important thing that a government wants to do in uncertainty is to uh, try and create, you know, certainty, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, if you even wanted to regulate MTN, you gotta be a bit more careful how you do it uh, in order not to make things that are already bad worse. Um, the, the third thing is also that the way in which you do it is very, very important. Um, and I think that if you look at the, the construct of our industry, you know, you have the government with the policy maker and then you have a regulator the regulator is supposed to be the referee of the game, and uh, he is supposed to basically enforce the rules of the game. So one would expect that, you know, if it comes to enforcing the rules of the game, uh, probably the, the, the regulator should be doing that, um, as opposed to um, probably the government, who is also a, a player in some way because he's a shareholder in some of the, comp some of the companies are owned by the government, right? Um, and so if you are not careful, you are kind of conflicted and which is why I'm also kind of, you know, being circumspect in my, uh, submission. Um, okay. then, uh, sorry, the second question was, how do you build, um, ISP, uh, for a community? A community. How easy is it? Yes. Yeah. It's not that easy, but it's all contextual. Um, I think that for communities, one of the ways that we've done this and it's worked very well is, is building what we call low cost um, ISPs. Because in most uh, communities, there is sort of the unit economics are not that strong. And so, you know, people cannot afford to pay, you know, uh, five uh, or even 10 Ghana cities a day to get, you know, a bundle service, right? So you want to be able to build something that is low cost, that people can afford. And so one of the ways is sort of using very low cost technology like Wi-Fi. Because Wi-Fi operates in a, in, a, in a spectrum that is unregulated. And so the cost of access is relatively low. Every device has Wi-Fi. Most devices have Wi-Fi on them. Um, and so most people can relatively access it. Um, you know, so the, the other part of that is sort of, if you build a rural, rural ISP, you want to also be able to connect it to your, you want to be connected to the urban centers to other people as well. And so um, the, the cost of purchasing that kind of bandwidth can be high. 
So in Ghana, for example, we have something called Giftel, which is uh, sort of subsidize, you know, uh, rural connectivity. And so they can give you some sort of support if you are creating something like that. Okay. And the third question was, um, how can we make data cheaper in Ghana? Um, I guess uh, it, it comes back to... Correct. You know. uh, I'm actually, uh, I've actually written a, a third, an op-ed on this that is coming out. Uh, end, end of this month is going to come out. And I think part of the, pro the challenge is that if you look at the, the equation, yeah. we have so much capacity on the beach. Currently, there are probably... I'm trying to remember, is it 25 terabits per second? And okay. it's because there's so many submarine cables, right? It's about five of them. But when you go inland, you know, if, when I was making my submission, I talked about how we started building inland fiber. Yeah. There's not as much inland fiber, right? Okay. So the ratio is almost like 10 to 1. So you have so much capacity on the beach, but it's almost like there's a big pipe like this on the beach. And yeah. then when it comes inland, it has to pump into a small pipe like that. Okay. So, so part of the thing is sort of creating uh, more of those pipes so that um, the capacity on the beach can flow in. But the third important thing is really that you have to build what we call the African internet backbone, which is connectivity between countries. Because invariably, if you look at it right, it's really interacting among ourselves. And so if we build more infrastructure on the continent, we will be able to transmit our traffic on the continent. And therefore, um, all these applications that are being built will be hosted on the continent, right? So then you don't have to go out that much. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Um, I, I will come back to the, the general crowd to take questions, but there's, there's a question here that actually ties in with something very significant you said at the beginning of your presentation. So at the beginning of your presentation, you talked about the first time you encountered computers being in Accra Academy. And right. I recall that our first speaker who's also on this presentation, Fred Frimpong, um, also said the same thing, that his first time he ever saw a computer was in Accra Academy. That means that Accra Academy has given you two uh, some head start in, in your journey in life, right? So now the comment or the question that's in, in the chat box, is from Kweku Bruce, and he says digital transformation of our school. So I guess to put it in a question form, uh, Eric, uh, how can we digitally transform Accra Academy to, 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 to meet international standards, right? And, and build our school? Because I think somehow uh, the, it's no coincidence that the two speakers so far have talked about encountering computers first time in Accra Academy. Don't we owe it, you know, to our school to give back in helping the school transform? Absolutely, absolutely we do. Um, and I think that um, we all need to go back and, and help make that happen in a lot of yeah. ways. Um, uh, it's a very important step that we have to take. Um, and I think that um, it will have to be a collective effort and it will have yeah. to be very intentional. Um, and so I'm, I'm definitely willing to, you know, join that uh, movement to go back and see how we can help the school become more digital because okay. everything is becoming digital and, and we can not becoming digital. Well, so on that score, I, I guess I just want to volunteer you and, um, and, and Fred, uh, largely because your very prominent statements have pointed to the fact that Accra Academy was when, where you actually saw a computer for the first time. Let's make a commitment, and I will, I will include myself in this vein, let's make a commitment to go back and help our school to transform uh, digitally. All right, so I'll take two questions uh, and then you can you can uh, answer them. First from Fred Frimpong and then we'll go to uh, Abbas Tasunti as well. So Fred, over to you. Um, yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Um, I, I picked up on it uh, when um, Eric uh, mentioned it at the beginning of his presentation. And I think it's, it's very important uh, what you mentioned. 
In fact, the last time we went to do something at the school, uh, we went to um, inaugurate the, the staff common room. One of the comments that was made was that there were no computers anywhere. You know, they, we just put a bunch of desks there. And, and based on my last month's uh, presentation and this month, I think we need to do something, you know, to put more, more people. I mean, uh, it's, it's a bit different now, right? This was 1997. Um, but people are experiencing computers earlier on than, than before, but maybe they need to experience it in a different way than we experienced it. Um, it was put in front of us and we were just allowed to kind of play with it on our own. Um, we need to be actively trying to create people that use computers to create. Um, and maybe this is where we need to go. We need to go back to the school and create more people like, like, um, like us. Uh, but people that are going to use the computer to create something rather than people that are going to play with it, so to speak. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, thank you. So let's, uh, Senior, Senior Albert, forgive me. So I'll come to Albert as well. So let's go to Abbas and then we'll come to Albert and then Eric, you can answer. Uh, Abbas, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much for such an insightful um, presentation, Eric. And my question is, um, we've been hearing a lot about 5G these days. Um, we have 4G in Ghana. And I know not many parts of Ghana currently are experiencing 4G, even though we have 4G in Ghana. Um, how would you say Ghana or in Africa as a whole is ready for 5G and how is it going to help us in our development as, a, um, as economies on the African continent? Okay, thank you. Senior Albert, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoyed the session, and uh, Blaubiak was my SP when I was in the academy. He has even given me a name on social media, Facebook, back of which I need to create a business out of it. Senior, um, I have two questions for you. You know, I'm, I, I am <coughs> Blaubiak biased. I'm looking at how you can, uh, as it were, fish out for Blaubiak in your form of the entrepreneur offers that you give out onto the continent. So what plans are you having for BLOB to enjoy this package? Secondly, we are in the pandem pandemic era, which means our lives have been more or less changed one way or the other. We cannot meet on a large scale, but we also need to organize our events going forward. What will you advise in terms of tools or applications that we should be able to help and deploy for us to you know, continue to have our programs, notwithstanding the impact of um, the pandemic together with the restrictions given to us in this country. Thank you so much. Albert, yeah. okay. okay, thank you, Albert. Uh, Eric, over to you. I think uh, you can do justice to these. Uh, subjects. Okay. Um, on the on the first question, uh, the first one, I, I, I'm told that agreement that uh, um, you know five uh, G is uh, is the next wave. Um, but uh, sort of my take is that it, it, you know we we shouldn't just you know there's a whole marketing part to this stuff and there's a whole sort of um, sort of movement around it, but my, my view is that you want to rather focus, uh, not rather, but you have to do two things. So, so you need to get 5G, but you also want to make uh, more and more people get access. Right? And so it's not enough to just have a few people get 5G and get to 10G, but how do we get um, everybody to at least get 3G, right? So if we can get everybody at least get three or 4G, across Ghana, across Africa, that would be great. In other words, my, my point is that you need to not only make the pipe bigger, but you want to widen the net. You know, the same thing like taxes, right? You want to bring more people into a tax bracket as opposed to taxing the few people a lot. Higher. So, so, so that's sort of the way I see it. And I think that 
Um, part of that process is also making the cost of access affordable, right? Um, bringing it in the economic bracket of more and more people. And one of the ways to do that is to create um, content that is relevant for them. Because when you have relevant content that is hosted, it makes a case for why people must, must go online and must get access. So that's very, very important. Um, the, the, the second, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm losing my memory. So Albert, Albert asked about uh, how are you deliberately, what plan do you have to, to help Blow B to benefit Blow B. from the many investments that you're doing across the continent? <clears throat> um, um, so, I mean, we don't, I don't have a deliberate plan, but obviously if you're blabby and you have a business, uh, we will look at it. Um, you know, uh, investing is a very, uh, it's an act that I'm still learning myself. Um, and so uh, I would not say that I'm a master of it here, but, but obviously, um, if, if you, uh, been to, our, if you're blabby and, and you approach me, obviously, I, you know, I will take that into consideration when we're making, we're looking at our opportunities. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll be lying to you if I say that we have a deliberate, any deliberate plan for the Blow B. But like I said, if, if you're Blow B and you want to start a business or you're an entrepreneur, I'm open to finding ways to work together uh, and to help um, if I can. Okay. So um, I, I will go to Ola. Um, and then after that, I will... Yeah, the second question is not advisory. Oh, sorry, Albert. Yeah. We missed your question. Please repeat. Uh, you know, we are in this pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Meaning our lives have been noted. So we need to, you know, use... Okay, Albert, to use Albert, I remember the question now. So here, you know, one of the, 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 the classes of this pandemic, um, which I put in the in one of my blog posts was that it's really speed up um, um, digitization, right? And so, Albert, one of the things is that, um, you know, I mean, we as human beings, you know, we are social beings, right? We need to see each other, we need to interact. But probably one of the things that this virus is telling us is that we need to do that a little bit less and, and probably do more things, you know, on the screen. Obviously, that, that is a bit of a, there's a bias in that statement because, you know, I, I, I do digital and I, I work with, uh, in this industry. So probably I'm biased in my submission. Um, but, but for me, like sitting here tonight and, and talking to, to all of you is a pretty amazing experience to me. It's almost like, you know, um, uh, you know, if I was back in school with you, right? Uh, and I so, you know, you need to, kind of see this, uh, obviously we are not in school, we've moved on and we've changed, you know, I've put on a beard now and all that stuff, but, but probably you want to, you know, get used to this new normal, right? In the new normal, you, you're going to have to sort of create the, 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 the meetings, the, the, the group meetings, probably say, you know, we'll do a, a physical meeting maybe once a year or once every quarter or once every six months or once every three months. And then we'll do the rest uh, by Zoom or via, um, you know, our own channels. Um, and now that everybody's trying to do things virtually, uh, that's another business opportunity. Maybe you want to start a company that will compete with Zoom. So I'll start a Ghana version, call it something, right? That's a business opportunity that somebody will start some company that will try to do this a little bit differently. So, so yeah, I, I think that my view is that life is not going to go back to the old normal. It's going to be a new normal. Um, especially, I mean, if you look at the virus, right? I mean, there are certain, the three critical things. I mean, I mean, this coronavirus is just like any flu, that, you know, any flu-like thing that we've seen. But unfortunately, the, the, the real thing with this virus is that um, we don't have the therapeutics. Um, I'm not sure we don't have the treatment and we don't have the vaccine. Right. So if you look at it, a lot of the effort is on the, you know, preventive protocols, which is that people must social distance. In other words, don't be close to people. You know, you have to wear a mask. 
you know, so that if you have it, you're not transmitting it. And if I have it, if I don't have it, I don't get it, right? And yeah. then thirdly, we must wash your hand a lot. And so, so that is a preventive measure. And that's the only way that we have been able to, at least in Africa, in this case, Africa was, uh, Africa really has been the best continent and we're able to prevent the virus. So I really believe that even though we are easing down the restrictions, we should still observe these protocols because this virus is still out there. And it's a very vicious virus. Actually, I, I had one of my friends, close uh, friends, who's an entrepreneur, die from the virus. Um, and uh, and I, have, I had two friends who had the virus and recovered. And I actually have one who's just got the virus and is doing very well. And uh, I don't plan on having the virus and that's why I'm home. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and, I, and I've been working from home, um, literally the last, I've locked myself at home with my family for the past uh, three months, since the beginning of March. Um, okay. I go to see my extended family over the weekend since the, real, the lockdown was uh, eased. But I've mostly been working from home. Fortunately for me, my work is all online. So you may say, again, I'm biased in some way because most of what I do is online. Um, and so we shut on our office and we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't even have an office anymore. We're mostly work. me and my partners are all working from home. Um, so, so that would be my advice um, that, you know, you need to, you know, we need to change our habits and we need to conform to the new normal in some form. Until okay. we have a vaccine and we have the, you know, therapeutics and all that stuff, it's going to take time. It's, it's not going to be the old normal. Okay. So let me take uh, the question from Ola Lante. Ola Lante, I see your hand up. Is it by mistake? No, it's not by mistake. Okay, good. Okay, please go ahead. Uh, I want to ask Eric a question. Um, these days, uh, we hear of the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth yeah. industrial revolution. And we are told that the countries that will prepare better for it are the ones that are going to do well in future. And it's going to disrupt a lot of the traditional industries. But when you look at Ghana as a country, at the high level, when you look at the country, the strategy, you don't find much discussion on it. And today I was listening to a program where some experts were brought to come and talk about the future of our economy. Kwame Pienim and some other people were there. There was also an archbishop also there. But I was expecting that people like you, would, one of you will be there. So I'm asking that from where you, you are, uh, the kind of connections that you have, how can you help so that we can bring this conversation up? Because I believe that if we want to get to where we want to be in future, these are the things that we need to do. But it looks like when you look at the policy of the, of the country, we, we are not talking about this. And countries like Rwanda, I think Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia are far ahead of us. So how can you do and how can you also help our school so that when it comes to that, we can be like the MIT or the Stanford of this kind of revolution? Okay, great question. Um, Eric, the wall is yeah. in your heart. Yeah, it's a very tough question to answer, but I, I, I definitely uh, see where you're coming from. It's a very valid question and a very strong question. Now, the, the way um, I see the world is that, you know, um, we all have different skill set and we all have different abilities and we have different reach, right? Um, and also, we all have limitations and we can't solve it. So, you know, I, 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 unfortunately, I'm not skilled in policy and I'm not in government and I'm not, you know, um, you know, I won't get invited to every radio show, unfortunately. That's just how life is, you know. Uh, you know, luckily I got invited to, to meet my colleagues uh, today and I'm sharing my experience. And if I get invited, maybe I will, I will share my views. But uh, I, I don't think that uh, probably my, uh, my, my views uh, um, will, will, will be that different. What I'm sharing here will be the same thing probably I would say out there. I, I, I really believe though that entrepreneurship and, and digital is the way of the future. And, uh, you know, it'll be get good for our policymakers and our um, executive leadership to, to pay attention. I, you talk about Rwanda. Actually, I, I was involved in writing Rwanda's ICT policy. I've met President Kagame himself. He was very involved in that process because he wanted to build a digital nation. And so he himself was very active. He started with policy uh, people and, 
you know, you know, people brought experts to sit down and write a policy, and he was very involved. So, so I agree with you that we need to do that. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not in a position to influence that, um, you know, uh, to a very large extent. But if I'm asked, I, I will share my views. Uh, I've so, done that class, as I said, you know, with the IT policy during the former. Yeah. During Kofu's government. So uh, uh, let me drill down a little bit on that. So right. how, how would you diagnose Ghana's problem? Is it a case of um, unwillingness on the part of leadership or is it a case of infrastructural deficits? Because you, you, you said something about having, you know, the submarine cables at the, at the shore, right? And so at the shore, you have this vast kind of internet. And then inland, it shrinks and keeps shrinking. So you can you can have 4G right here and just move, let's say, a few hours inland and you 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 can barely even get 2G. What is Ghana's problem in your view? And yes, if you got invited, assuming this is the forum, uh, what will be the way forward that you would share? Um, you know, I, I, I think that our development agenda um, needs to have a bit more coordination. Unfortunately, we, we as a country have not had a very uh, coordinated development agenda. Actually, we've had that on paper. I don't know if you guys remember Vision 2020, and we're yes. in 2020. <laughs> yeah. so, now we are in 2020. You know, yeah. back in the day, Vision 2020 was the big vision of Ghana, and we're in 2020. Yeah. And I'm waiting for somebody to kind of tell us what have we, have we achieved that vision 2020, right? So, so what I'm trying to say is that sort of, first of all, you know, we, we've always had good visions on paper, but this game is a game of execution. Exactly. Right? So we haven't followed through to execute those things into reality. And that's why we haven't had, and we are now seeing the results that we wanted to see. That's the difference between us and Rwanda, for example, or between us and other countries. Um, and so there need to be, uh, first of all, let me also say that, look, we, we are not that bad in Ghana, you know, but we can be much, much better, right? Absolutely. We've come a long way, but we have a very long way to go. Yeah. So, so I do think that we need to do a lot more and we could have been much, much ahead if we just did some very, you know, low hanging uh, fruits and things, for example. Um, I'll give you an example. When we, we envisaged the National Communication Backbone, um, NCBC, one yeah. of the ideas was that that entity needs to be a neutral provider that is not owned by any of the operators so that it will only provide terrestrial connectivity and then be able to build the terrestrial fiber network across the continent. And then you can also license other operators to compete with them. And those guys will only be focused on terrestrial fiber, what you call long haul, right? Now, if you develop that industry, if we had developed that industry, we would have by now had the mobile operators, and then we'll have these are what you call career neutral providers who provide just the long haul. They will build the long fiber pipes from Accra to Tamale to uh, OT region to Western region to Central region to Sunyani and all those things, right? But in the absence of that, the mobile operators have had to build their own infrastructure. So you see that for the mobile operators, they will build into areas where the economics are strong because they want to be able to maximize the return on their investment, right? And so they will basically build in that way because, you know, I mean, I'm an investor. If I invest in a company, I'll look for a company that is able to make returns, right? Yeah. And so, some of those mechanisms would have, would have probably made a difference in my okay. view. Okay. So let's go take a question from Cephas. It says Cephas iPhone. Um, <clears throat> if you're still here, Cephas. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, Eric. Good evening, Yao and all. Um, Good evening, Cephas. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, immediately your profile was posted on the page. I tried to go and look up whatever you did on the TED talk and it was so great. Yeah, you know, and that was a good one in projecting Africa to the world. Um, my question is actually on uh, how technology is going to quickly drive 
um, you know, the transition of energy from the from the non-renewable to the renewable energy. And, you know, the focus of this question is actually the timeline. I mean, people are looking at uh, something like 20 years, I they say 50 years, I they say it's never going to happen. But you, and I know, but to me, I know that uh, it's definitely going to be technology which is going to drive this quickly. And, you know, if you check the history of technology and how it has, uh, you know, moved things in the world, it from the year, from 2000 coming to date, it's been very, very fast as compared to the previous years. So I believe it's going to change rapidly, but what's your take on that? How long do you think it's going to take based on your experience and what you've heard in the industry and stuff like that? Actually, you know, there's, there's been a, a prior revolution that has been happening, as you rightly, Seth has put out, um, that has been running power to the mobile revolution, which is sort of the renewables, right? And 20 years ago, solar was not known. Today, solar is becoming the in thing, right? And there's also other forms of renewables that, you know, have become very, very, very prominent. Um, and I strongly believe that we are going to see the emergence of what uh, I call micro and mini grids. In other words, the centralized grid system is not going to be the, the way forward. Because if you look at the population growth and urban development, it's going to be have to have the centralized grid system that runs an entire country. So you're going to have the centralized grid, but also you're going to have these micro and mini grids that emerge. Right? For example, the estates in which I am, we have solar here. And so we're able to use that to counterbalance the, the load on the grid. In certain areas where they don't have the grid, they will probably go straight to solar. And by doing that, they'll be building their own grid. And so once you put smart metering on it, and then by extension, you put uh, mobile money on it. I mean, there's a company in Kenya called Mcopa. They're building these micro grids uh, in uh, and mini grids in East Africa. They basically lay out the solar farms and they connect them to mobile money. And then they go into this rural, they do this in these rural areas. And so the way people get uh, power is when they put money into their uh, M-Pesa, which is their mobile money, and then they pay. So in the evening, uh, a family wants to just get their kids to do their homework. They put in two shillings, and then the power comes on for one hour. The kids do homework, they eat, they do everything. Then after one hour, the power goes off, they go to bed. They don't have to invest in any solar, they don't have to do anything. All they have to do is pay per use, right? So the pay per use model that we've seen in, you know, um, you know, mobile as a way to communicate is not gone into energy. And I believe that you're going to see a lot of that um, in semi-urban and rural parts of Africa. Because again, the cost, the, the investment needed is going to be so high and, and, and the unit economics are not going to be able to support it. So you've got to find alternative ways that are less capital intensive to make those investments and to spread those infrastructure. And so I believe that that's what you're going to see. And so I, I totally agree with you. And you, okay. you need that also, by the way, for, every, for, for internet to work and for telecom to work, you need power, right? So part of what has been happening at this part of the revolution has been happening at the same time and empowering a lot of the internet stuff that we have been seeing. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Eric. Uh, I guess we still have time for a few more questions and then we can wrap up. Uh, so colleagues, the floor is open, but while I'm waiting for our colleagues to come up, Eric, there is a big interest in what we can do. And, and it goes back to an earlier question that you answered or that we, we took a commitment on what we can do to strategically position Accra Academy as if you like the mini uh, Silicon Valley of Ghana or you know the 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 IT beginning point from of Ghana, and I'm particularly interested in this concept because I've taken time to study the Presec model, right? Of of education, it's kind of geared very much towards producing entrepreneurs, 
and 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 people who challenge the status quo who find you know new ways of doing things and, and it seemed to have gone on for some time and right now i'm sure you can relate uh, with this you find a lot of them in very strategic uh, areas right so bringing this to uh, Accra academy and with your experience and expertise in the digital space how can we uh, beyond just transforming Accra Academy into like a digital institution, um, also make Accra Academy the mini Silicon Valley of, of Ghana. Okay. Um, uh, you know, it's, that's, it, it's possible, but it's going to take time. You know, Silicon Valley was built over more than 50 years with a lot of investment and a lot of capital. Um, okay. After the Second World War, one of my friends is a guy called Tim Draper. Tim Draper's um, uh, grandfather um, was one of the guys who built Silicon Valley. And after that, he came from the Second World War, and the Stanford family basically gave him money because they said he needs to go and find companies to invest in. I give that history to give a context that it was intentional, and there was a lot of investment to back it. And it was a community. Um, that wanted to create a technopole, a point in the U.S., a place in the U.S. where technology innovation comes out. And so it took okay. a lot of time and a lot of investment for that to happen. Um, and I believe that we can do it in a crack academy, but it's got to be deliberate, it's got to be consensual, and it needs a lot of investment. But we have to start from somewhere. Exactly. And that somewhere is, we have to ask our question, what is the defining vision of Accra Academy as an institution? I see there's another question in the, in the, in the question that talks about um, Accra Academy as the MIT of Ghana. Yes. I said the question, the thing that we have to ask ourselves is, what do we want Accra Academy to become in the future? Is it going to be a science institution, an entrepreneurial institution? Is it going to be a liberal arts institution, right? So we as academicians have to define that future. If we say we want Accra Academy to become the technology institution of the future, then that becomes the guiding light in which we build a path towards, right? So, and that's what I mean by it's got to be a collective action. We as okay. academicians have to decide. We, Accra Academy was started, the founding fathers had a vision of the institution. Yeah. That vision has made us what we are. Um, the question we have to ask ourselves, do we want to continue that same vision or do we want to have a new vision for the institution? Right? In any case, do you, rem do you remember what that vision is? I mean, what, what the forefathers started? And, and I'm asking, I mean, purely yeah, out of curiosity. Yeah, it's that vision. We, we, it was in our, it's in our anthem. I remember... Uh, every time when we sang our anthem to make great men of them, right? Yes. They had a vision. That vision is very enshrined in our anthem. Yeah. And we sang it every day. And I think that subconsciously that vision sank into us. And I believe that that's what has made us who, what we are, at least has made me who I am. Um, okay. I, I know definitely that if I hadn't gone to Accra Academy, probably I wouldn't be talking to you today. I wouldn't have been doing what I'm doing. Exactly. That is very clear to me. Uh, okay. in, in every sense of the word. And so the, the question is, in my view, is that we have to make a determination. Do we want to continue that vision? Is it yeah. that path? If it's that path, that's great. I'm not saying it's, a, it's not a bad path because obviously it's created us a lot of amazing people and it's made us who we are today um, in life. And, and then technology will help us do that. In other words, what I'm trying to say is, so sorry, I know you have to go, but I'm trying to say that, you know, even though I'm a technologist and I invest in technology, technology is always an application. It's the application of technology that unlocks value. So yeah. you have to now come up with the value you want to create. And then technology enables you to achieve it, right? Um, and so we have to define what we want the new vision to be as academicians. And okay. then technology will guide us there. Okay. Thanks, Eric. Um, I will take a quick comment by 
another uh, my senior boys prefect um, right. who is also on the line, and I, I guess it's a forum for the SPs to to showcase a few things. Um, I'll take a question from him, and then we'll go to Abbas uh, for another question. So he says, Eric, you mentioned colonial masters at the beginning. What right. are your real thoughts about that assessment? Uh, it may be a bit off topic, but obviously other people on here have other interests. So right. I think that's a very interesting one because uh, he also comes from a different background. Uh, yeah. And uh, let me say kudos uh, to Kwame Elane. Yes, Erica. Yeah, my, my views on that are very strong. And that's, that's going to be another whole... Do you have another whole day? <laughs> <laughs> I, wish, I wish I did, you know. <laughs> but but the, so, the, the short version is that, you know, you know, I mean, we as Africans had a pre-colonial history. Unfortunately, the history that has been written in our books and were taught in school is mostly our colonial and post-colonial history. So it almost okay. looks like there was no Africa before the colonial masters came or the colonizers came. Um, and, I, and I've studied and researched a lot to realize that there was a whole life before, which was a much, much better life before, um, okay. um, before the colonial masters came. Uh, and so part of it is that we, we as Africans um, need to revisit our, our, our original roots. Uh, um, yeah, if if I could just, um, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, yes, I'm doing yes, this. Yes, I can, I can hear yeah, you, Kwame. Right. So Kwame actually uh, passed the comment. So over to you, Kwame. Do you need uh, some more clarification? Yes, I, I don't intend to be a pain in anybody's uh, back or wherever it is. Uh, but Eric, thank you very much. Uh, impressive work you're doing. And I like the idea that we're moving away from um, connectivity to creativity. I like that very much. And I also like the point you made that is about the unlocking of the value in technology. So Eric, uh, in my field, language is very important to me. And that's probably why I pinpointed that particular comment you made. Um, especially with everything happening around the world at this moment in time, mm -hmm. um, the expression of colonial masters um, just did not sit well with me. And we've got an audience of uh, 47 people right now. And I think that um, as we are demonstrating one way within our own internal spaces, we should also have that consistency of messaging. And that is why I wanted to raise, raise the issue quickly. Okay, so Kwame, um, the, the real issue for you is the use of the phrase colonial masters. Uh, I guess he did in, in, in context, I mean, in reference to history. Uh, I, I agree. I think yeah. he was very good by saying that we had a pre-colonial and post-colonial history. I don't okay. doubt the colonial history. I'm okay. just very much interested in the, in the moniker of masters um, ah. and, and, and just the why people who have caused so much grief to our own history would still in 2020 be called masters. Ah. I think if, if people are pulling statues down and we yeah. are rethinking history, should we in this Accra Academy platform call the same people masters? I'm just okay. thinking aloud. Absolutely. Well, well, well. You're absolutely right. Um, yeah. And uh, I think that feedback is very good faith. You're absolutely right. We need to change our language and we need to be much more positive uh, in, our, in our designation. And I guess it goes to buttress your African identity, which you are so proud of. And, and, and basically, we are, we are saying the same thing. Thank you for pointing that out, Kwame. Uh, let's take a bus and then I'll wrap up. I think we, we've, we're almost uh, there. Okay. Abbas. Thank you very much, Yao. Um, yes. Mine is more of a contribution um, okay. with regards to what we can do for Accra Academy um, as old boys. Um, I like the fact that he mentioned that we should look more at creativity, not connection. And um, I would want to ask, um, also want to say that the challenge you threw up, that um, we have to go back to the school as old boys and then have, find a way to make sure the digital economy is ingrained in the students right from the start. Because like uh, Eric said, it takes a long time for these things to happen and we can never wait unless we start. We can never do it unless we start. So if we can go back to the school and have a few dedicated old boys who will say that this is, the, whatever the vision of our academy is, I think with the way things are going, 
technology would always have a role to play in that. So we would have to find a way and go back to it. If you go to the tech, for example, they have something called a science club. I think Akka Academy has. But then it is very direct. So if we have something like that in Akka Academy where we look at how these boys can look at creativity with technology, where you go to Ashesi today and they have this robotics and all of that. And now there's, there are robotic competitions all over the world. So that's the challenge you've thrown. I just want to say that um, I saw someone from the 2002 year group saying they have a plan of doing something like that in the school and they're asking people to come on board. Let's find a way to connect as old boys and see how we can make these things and you not just be talking about it. Okay. Thank you very much, Abbas. Um, so we, we are wrapping up. Uh, uh, I, I want to thank all of you uh, for, for getting on the call. I will allow Abe Ashon to do the closing remarks, uh, but before he does that, uh, I, want to, I want to point out a few things. I'm not sure, I, sh I probably should have done a little census to find out how many BLEO 96 uh, uh, year group members are on this platform right now. Um, but from my own knowledge of the people on the platform, I'm not sure I see a lot of them. So we probably didn't do a good job, you know, marketing this uh, among Blow 96, but obviously this is a, a Blow 96 cherished man who's who's doing great stuff and has come to share a lot of um, wonderful ideas. Now the second thing is I want to task I want to take all of us on this call on this that we need to make a deliberate commitment to go back to our alma mater to make some difference. Um, and I say this out of experience because I lead the Blau 99 fraternity and we, as, as, as part of our 20th anniversary and in giving back to the school, we decided to renovate the uh, staff common room. Uh, if, you, if you ever saw the before and after uh, images of the work that we did there, it took a lot of sacrifice. It took a lot of commitment to get that done. Even so, we did not quite hit it because one very major flaw was the fact that we couldn't actually uh, equip it with, you know, uh, computers and uh, technology. But at least we tried <laughs> the best we could in our, within our widow's might to, to make a difference. And I tell you what, that became a subject of uh, discussion among the Presec 99 year old uh, year group boys. And, and I know this because I, frat I fraternize a lot with them. So I guess I'm charging all of us that, why don't we just take one, one key agenda? If it's about digital revolution of Accra Academy, why don't we take that and then a few of us put our, our, our hands to the, the wheel and try and drive it so that at least five, maybe five is too far, a year, three years, five years from this discussion, we can all look back and say, look, we had one Zoom call, we had a conviction, we made a commitment, and this is how, how much we have transformed our alma mater. All together for the good of the school, and finally for God and country, uh, or for country and God, which, whichever. So um, uh, I want to thank you, Blobi, uh, Eric, Osiakan. I think you've done a fantastic job, but I want to turn it over right now to uh, Abe Ashon to do the official thank you, and then we can wrap up. Abe Ashon, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Yao, for brilliant work. I like the way you have coordinated the meeting. And I also want to thank Eric. Eric, like I said, it's been a long time. If I had met you on the road, I would not have been able to recognize you. But I know you very well, except that you have changed. Well, as for change, <laughs> is necessary. Once you grow in, you change, the features will change. But you've done extremely well, and I want to congratulate you and to keep it up and continue to um, uh, lift the flag of a cracker, uh, Ghana, Africa high on the global uh, arena. And thank you all those who participated and for those who didn't uh, avail themselves of this for some very good reason. We also thank you, but I will wish that 
the recording is shared to most blow B, I think it will be very beneficial. Thank you. Thank and we you. want to see you again in a very short time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank and you. good night. Right. Thank you, Abe Ashon. Thank you, everybody. Blow B, Eric. Uh, right. We'll see you once again. We are grateful. I acknowledge the production team who helped me. Uh, these are strong guys in the engine room. Uh, Abbas, uh, yeah, Abbas Tasunti, Albert uh, Quarte, uh, George uh, Mensa, X-Ray. Thank you guys so much. God bless you and do have a wonderful evening. Good night. Good night.